I, uh, I want to brag on our ladies and their serve day yesterday out at the Navajo uh, Reservation. I'm hearing great reports uh, from that day, and thank you so much for uh, giving your day to go and to serve. Uh, it just sounded like an amazing, amazing day. Um, also, uh, many of you know, know, I talked about it last week, but I led a trip to Nicaragua this week with a group of pastors, and I just wanted to give you an update. Someone asked me during meet and greet if uh, our flights were on time, and none of them, not a single flight was on time, uh, not one, not going, not coming, not one flight was on time, but that's okay. We made it. And so I have a few pictures uh, to show you. This is our team with some of the uh, locals there. This is actually a, one of the Convoy of Hope projects where they're actually teaching them how to do a community garden, and uh, that was a fun, fun tour. Uh, and then we also toured uh, a church that uh, Convoy helped to start a business where they have beehives, and I have a, a picture to show you. Uh, they made us suit up in uh, these suits, and uh, I got out there, and I had these gloves that came way up here, and the whole thing, and pants, and boots, and uh, my... I really wanted to get pictures in the bee suit, and so I was, I was talking about it, and my friend Derek's like, dude, I've been around bees all the time. You can take your gloves off. It'll be all right. And the moment I took my glove off, a bee stung me right there. I mean, literally in seconds, it stung me. Um, but I survived the bee sting, and uh, it was, that, that was pretty cool. Um, and then uh, one of the main reasons we were there was working with their feeding initiative. And so there's a picture of uh, us at one of the feeding uh, centers. This is some of the kids uh, there. This particular center is out of a church that feeds 300 kids every single day. And I got to spend a couple of hours there. Uh, the kid in the white, he was quite the character. I have no idea what he was saying because I don't speak Spanish, but he was fun. He was a lot, a lot of fun. And I know you won't believe this, but uh, I snuck a, a fishing pole uh, in my suitcase and uh, I found a little lake there and y'all will not believe the fish that I caught in Nicaragua. So I have a picture to show you my incredible fish. <clears throat> That's for real. That is for, I couldn't even Photoshop that one and make it look big. I mean, it's just, that, that's, that's, all, that's all I got. Um, but thank you for uh, praying for us. We had an incredible time. You'll hear more about it later. Uh, we're actually planning now uh, with our entire state to do a statewide uh, Convoy of Hope feed one day later this year uh, to see how many kids we can feed as a, a collective of churches all across the state. State, and so you'll hear more about that. And then also, thank you to the 50, 60, 70, I don't know, I, never, I didn't count, of you who stayed last Sunday for our work day. Um, this picture tells a great story uh, <laughs> that we decided to pull, we were pulling out the carpet, and this is in our youth room. We demoed a wall. A few people got their anger out with some sledgehammers. But man, y'all made quick work of pulling up the carpet. I mean, we got that many people pulling up carpet. It goes so, so fast. We got it all demoed last week, and then this week, Pastor Jace and his crew have been in. I'll show you a picture of, of uh, the prog progress this week. You'll see the stage there on the left and the sound booth uh, on the right and the sound wall that we're building there in the back, and we had to remove a bunch of roof drains and patch up some windows, and so they've been working really, really hard. We'll be in there all week this week getting more done. This, by the way, this is part of the All In campaign, um, and this, this is all for the next generation. If you don't know at Harvest, we believe in the next generation. That's why we have 41 going to camp, uh, youth camp tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> Literally, while I was in Nicaragua, three more students signed up for camp, and that presented a new problem. We didn't have enough seats to take them. So Lisa called me. She's like, what are we going to do? And so we rented another van, and uh, that's a great problem to have, one I'm really grateful uh, to have to solve. And so um, we're just, they're doing a lot right now uh, for the next generation because we really, really believe that the future is in the next generation. And so thank you for helping uh, with this uh, project that we're doing right now. So here, here's the, the message today. We're in a series uh, called Familia. It's a whole series about how to family, 
All of us have family. Uh, some of you really, really love your family. Others uh, of you just tolerate them. You just kind of put up with them. And the Bible has a lot to say about how to family. And so I've been trying to help you the last few weeks as we've been, as we've been talking about this. And today's message in this series is titled, Fight for Your Family. Fight for for your family. I'm going to be in a book of the Bible in the Old Testament, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Primarily, I'm going to be in Nehemiah chapter 4, and and that's where we're going to be. And I'm going to start in verse 1 to kind of set it up. I'll give you a little history uh, of this book and the story that we're jumping into. We're going to talk about fighting for your family. Nehemiah 4 verse 1, when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed The Jews. Now, I'll pause and I'll just give you a little bit of history. The history is that the people of God had survived a civil war uh, and they they were actually divided into a northern territory and a southern territory. And in 722 BC, the southern kingdom was attacked by the Assyrians and the city was destroyed. And then in 586 and 587, in those years uh, BC, the southern kingdom was again attacked and this time they were taken taken into captivity by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were then um, destroyed. They were conquered by the Persians. And what was left of Israel were now living under the rule of Persia. Now the good news is that Persia was kind to Israel. uh, And so this was a kind of a new season for the people of God. And the Persians, they actually allowed the the people of God to begin to go back to their home. They they went back to, to Judah and they began to settle kind of on the outskirts of the town because the town had been destroyed. And this is where Nehemiah, the, the, the man, the, the book is Nehemiah. It's, it's also based on the man, Nehemiah. And this is where Nehemiah enters into the story. Uh, Nehemiah, if you go back to the first chapter, you learn that his, his profession is that he's a cupbearer to the king. This is a pretty high position in their local government. His job literally was to taste all the food and all the drink that the king was about to eat. And the idea was that uh, kings at that time were often poisoned. And so if the cupbearer lived, then the king would eat or drink the food. If the cupbearer died, then, oh, well, let's get a new cupbearer, right? And so Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah, uh, his heart is broken for the state of of his home. Now this is where it gets into the series that we're currently in about family, is that Nehemiah's heart is broken over the state of his home. And some of us today, that describes you as you reflect on your home, on your family, is that there's a brokenness in your heart because of things that are happening in your family. And if that's you today, I'm really glad you're here because I believe that the Holy Spirit has orchestrated today and this particular message especially for you. If we go back to Nehemiah chapter 1, it tells us about Nehemiah's broken heart for his home. It says this in verse 2, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem, about their home. And they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall has been broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. And Nehemiah responds like this. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. And for some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. You'll notice that as Nehemiah is confronted with this broken heart for his home, that he does three things. He fasts, he mourns, and he prays. That's his initial response to the brokenness is he fasts, he mourns, and he prays. And so I want us to use that as a starting point today as we talk about this idea of fighting for your family. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. If you come to Harvest regularly, you know that this is part of our tradition, that we pause as we're getting ready to open God's Word and look into His Word for what He has for us today. Because here's what we believe here, is that God's Word is living and it's active. What that means is it's unlike any book, any other book that you've ever read. Even if it's a 
really good book. It's different than that book because today as we open it to Nehemiah and we read the words on the pages, the Holy Spirit can cause it to come alive to your heart and to your spirit. And the Holy Spirit can give you a fresh word for exactly what you and your family need today. And that's what I believe is going to happen. So we do this thing where we just pause and we pray and we just say, God, I'm opening my heart. I'm listening. Will you talk to me today? And I'll just tell you this. He's faithful. He always does. Do you believe that? All right. Are you ready to pray with me? It takes 20 seconds. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's living and it's active. And I believe that today you have a word for us. So Lord, we just pause. We position our hearts. We get ready. We listen for your word today. In Jesus' name, to, uh, Jesus name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. As Nehemiah begins the rebuilding of his home, what we'll notice right away in chapter 4 is that he has some enemies and his enemies get upset. Verse 2, chapter 4 says this, In the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, this is Sanballat, one of his enemies, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah, who is at his side, said, what they are building, he's, he's, he's teasing them with this phrase. He says, what they're building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown down insults in the face of the, builder, of the, uh, of the builders. Verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height, for the people worked with all of their heart. Here's a phrase that just caught my attention as I was reading this story and I was thinking about fighting for your family is that it says that they begin to build the wall. He says, so we rebuilt the wall. We rebuilt the wall. It just, that caught my attention. It, this idea that, that their family, their home had been destroyed. Nehemiah's heart is broken, but he goes to work and they're rebuilding the wall. And today, some of us need to go to work rebuilding, uh, rebuilding what's broken in our families. It says there that they worked with all of their heart. The message version says that they had a heart for the work. And, and what I'm hoping today is that if you're in a place where something is broken in your home, I'm hoping to stir something in you to believe that your marriage, that your family, that your kids are worth the work that it's going to take to build a healthy family. Because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to have a healthy home. But I'm here today to tell you that it is totally worth it. Verse 7 continues, when Sambalot Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed. They were angry. They had some enemy here. So they plotted together to come together and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is getting out. In other words, they're getting tired from all of this work. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. And then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Let me explain what's happening in this section of the scripture. Maybe you've heard this term, friendly fire. <laughs> this is a military term that just means that, that the, 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 the fire is coming from our own side, right? It's friendly fire. Like we're on the same team, but you're firing against us. That's what's happening in Nehemiah chapter four is that they're rebuilding. They have a very real enemy. The enemy is 
is taunting them, but that's gotten into some of their hearts, and now their friends are starting to believe the lies of the enemy, and now they're spreading it amongst their own. They're, they're picking at one another. They're discouraging one another. They're putting one another down, and so now they're not only having to defend from the actual enemy, but now there's some friendly fire within the ranks. And I, I just felt like I should remind you today, church, that, that there's no place in the church for friendly fire. <laughs> this, is, this is where uh, we're, what we're seeing in Nehemiah's story. Nehemiah's working hard to rebuild his home, but he's got some friends that come to discourage him. They, they come to, to put him down, to, to let him, to, to, to discourage him from this work. And verse 12, it says, the Jews who lived there uh, near them. So that's, that's what I'm saying. They're, it's the neighbors. This is the ones that are living with them. They're, they're Jews that are living there. And 10 different times, it says, 10 times over, they kept discouraging them. They say, whatever happens, they're going to attack us. We're never going to finish this, in other words. We're never going to get this done. And let me just tell you today, and I don't, it might not even sound nice, but it's okay. If you have friends like this, if you have friends that are always discouraged, Encouraging you from the rebuilding, from the hope of God for your family. If you have friends like that, here's my best advice for you. Are you ready for it? Get some new friends. You don't need friends like that. I'm just telling you. You don't, you don't need people in your life who are going to discourage you and put you down and, and persuade you that God's plan for your family is not going to succeed. Church should be a place where we don't fight with one another, but we fight for one another. And that's today, today's message is around this idea to fight for your family. It's amazing to me, and maybe you've seen this in parts of your life, it's amazing to me how hard we will fight for things that we really want. Have you noticed this? How, how hard, if you want something, you will fight hard for it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, back in, I think it was November, Taylor Swift uh, announced that she was going to go on tour again, the ERA tour. And this was a really big deal. She hadn't been on tour in a number of years. And she's a business person. So she came up with this plan of how you could get tickets and the day they were going to come out. And if you had a Capital One card, you got early access. And, and all they had all of these things. And there was like this, this buzz, if, if, you were, if you like T-Swift. There was a buzz. If you don't, you don't even know what I'm talking about, right? If the, but there was a buzz, and everyone's clamoring. Like, how do I get a ticket? How do I get a ticket? Cheyenne was like, how do I get a ticket? How do I get a ticket? If you know Cheyenne. Um, everyone, if, if you wanted one, there was just like, how do I get a ticket? And I, I was reading an article this week about this. And here's what it said. Is it said, anyone who's tried to buy a, a, a big concert ticket in the last few years knows that the process has changed. Securing face value tickets for any show is almost a sport these days. So they did some math, and it says, according to calculations by bookies.com, an online destination for all things sports betting, Taylor Swift fans had a 2% chance of scoring general sales tickets at face value for her era tour. A 2% chance. You don't just like log on and buy a ticket anymore. There became this, this fight. Like, I, 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 how am I going to get the ticket? And people did all kinds of crazy things to get a ticket. I remember this isn't quite uh, as, as big of a deal as it used to be. But do y'all remember when new iPhones would be released? And they, people would line up. They would camp out outside of the stores for sometimes for days waiting. Just real quick. Did any of you ever camp out for an iPhone? I just need to know. Any, oh, my goodness. Anyone else? Anyone else? No one else wants to admit it. No one else. I know it. Some of you did it. You don't want to admit it. It's okay. How about this? Did you know that there's a new chicken restaurant in town? It's called Raising Cane's. Has any, have, real quick, how many of you have been to Raising Cane's? You're going to, okay, wait, hey, you work for Chick-fil-A. You're not, you're not supposed to, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. I've been to, I've been to, um, so uh, Ava had surgery a couple of weeks ago. 
and uh, she loves raising canes. And so one day I thought it'd be nice, and I'd swing by. Notice, swing by. I'm just going to pop in to raising canes and get some chicken to bring home to Ava. And I got there, and I, on the way, I'm thinking, I'm just going to go to the drive-thru. That's all, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to go to the drive-thru. And it was a double drive-thru, and it went out of their parking lot and into the next parking lot and between two buildings and behind those buildings and down a side road. And I'm like, holy cow. I'm just going to get in line. Well, I had to park about a quarter mile away, and I got in line, and there were about 100 people in front of me, and we were outside. We weren't in, even in the building. And I remember calling Lisa, and I was telling her about it, and she's like, babe, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And I'm like, no, this is, this is I want Ava. I want, this is important for her. So I waited an hour, y'all, an hour in line to get Raisin Cane's chicken, all right? And the next day, I went back to Chick-fil-A. All right, that's, that I'm loyal. I am loyal. It is amazing how much we will go through to get something that we deem to be important to us. And today, this is the question, is are you willing to fight for your family? My hope is that you'd be more inclined to fight for your family than for raising Cain's chicken fingers. I, I'd hope that you'd be more inclined to fight for the health of your marriage than to figure out a way how to get Taylor Swift tickets. Are you willing to fight for your family. Uh, I have an aunt who, growing up, I, I remember when we would go to their house, she, um, I had two cousins uh, that lived in her house, her, her sons, and uh, they were close to my age. And I remember, because I thought it was weird when I would go over, because her two boys, often when I would get there, they would have a hanger, like that you put a sh shirt on and hang in the closet. They'd have a hanger in the back of their shirt, like back here, so the hanger would sit up here like this. And, and what it was, it's really weird, is it was to remind them to have good posture, all right? Because it was uncut. It, it forced them to like, keep their shoulders back. And they, they couldn't slouch or it would like, and it was weird, y'all. It was really weird. But I thought of it this week because I want to talk to you today about posture, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot in this message about posture because today some of us need to be reminded to fight for what I'll just call a godly posture when it comes to our family because there's too many um, people, there's too many families who are just walking around with their shoulders, you know, slouched. And, and I'm not actually talking about your actual posture. I'm talking about the demeanor that you have towards your family. And what I'm, what I'm saying is this, is if I could kind of define that posture is that you've just accepted that whatever your family looks like, that that's just how it's going to be. You just accept it. You just kind of, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just stuck in a mediocre marriage. I, I'm just stuck. My, my family is just, we're just kind of stuck here. And, and I want to, that's why I'm, I'm really going to try hard today to stir you to fight for your family, to fight for a godly posture. I had a talk with Ava this week uh, while, while I was in Nicaragua. Um, she was here, and I called home to kind of check in, and she had something that was going on, and so we were talking about this. And, and I remember saying to her that day on the phone, I said, Ava, I'm so proud of you. And I want to tell you why I'm proud of you, as I'm proud of you because in this, in this instance, this thing that you're, you're fighting in your life is that you are willing to do the hard work to overcome in this area of your life. And I told her, I said, Ava, there's a lot of people in the world who are not willing to do the hard work. And a lot of people, even older than you, they would just accept that this is how it is. And I'm, I don't have, I'm not gonna overcome it. But I said, Ava, I'm proud of you because you have decided to believe that with God's help that you can overcome this. And that's what I wanna say to you is that maybe you've accepted your fate when it comes to your family, I want to encourage you today that, that God has so much more for you today. So much more. I'm, I'm here today to encourage you to change your posture when it comes to your family. To believe God's best for your family, for your marriage, for your kids. To, to, to straighten your shoulders. To lift your head. That I'm telling you, God has amazing plans for your family. But on the flip side, you also need to know that you have an enemy. And the enemy wants the opposite 
of what God wants for your family. And this is why it's, it's almost a requirement that, that men and women of God, that we change our posture and that we're willing to fight for our family. I'll go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. This is kind of the, the rally cry at the end of, of this passage that we've read. In verse 14 it says this. It says, don't be afraid of them. In other words, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And here it is. And fight for your family. This is where I got the message title. Fight for your family, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and for your homes. That's the rally cry. He says, don't be afraid. Fight for your family. Listen, we have to fight because we have an enemy. The, the word talks about, the Bible talks about our enemy in a lot of places, but it's really clear in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil. Okay, so that defines the enemy. Because some of you weren't sure who the enemy was. Some of you thought you married the enemy. That's not who the enemy was. Okay, it says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Listen, when you realize that you have an enemy, your posture changes. I had a posture changing moment this week. Um, I was on a, one of the flights flying home, and, uh, and uh, I, I was kind of towards the front of the economy section, and uh, the, the, we got up, and, and the seatbelt light went off, and instantly, like, a lot of people went to the bathroom, and I kind of needed to go, but there was a lot of people, so I waited, but I kind of monitored it. I kept looking back, and I was, like, waiting for the line, and there was a gap. Like, people were done, that no one was in line, so I hop up out of my seat, and I'm making my way down the little skinny aisle back to get to the back, and I saw this happen, y'all. I'm telling you, it really happened. As I'm going towards the bathroom, two people, one on this side and one on this side, looked at me, looked at the bathroom, looked back at me, and jumped up to get in front of me and, and hustled to get, and I'm telling you what happened in the moment. One was an old man, one was a kid. Don't judge me for this. They looked me in the eye. They knew what they were doing. My posture changed. I'm shuffling down the aisle. I looked up. I'm like, I was ready to fight. Like right there, I'm like, I'm about to put y'all in a headlock. That was not even cool. I, I was, and then I realized, I talked myself down. I'm like, it's an old man and it's a kid. But they knew, they, that was what frustrated. They looked me in the eye, they looked at the bathroom, they looked at the bathroom. I'm like, oh man, my posture changed. I calmed myself down, I waited, they came out. I, I, it, it was all good. But it was interesting how, how, how just instinctively, my posture like changed. I was, I was ready to, for, you know, not really a fight, but like, like an encounter. I was like, like th at that moment, those two dudes were my enemy, right? And my, my posture changed. When it comes to your family, you have an enemy. His name is Satan. He has a very clear plan for your family. In fact, I'm going to help you to see the plan because it's, it's the same plan he's been using since the beginning, if we go back to Genesis, the first, chap, first book of the Bible, in the first couple of chapters, we read about the first man, the first woman, the first family. They start having kids. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan attacks their marriage. He tries to come between Adam and Eve. In, in Genesis chapter 4, Satan then goes after their kids. And, and I just want to point out this strategy because he's still doing it today. Is that I believe that marriage is under attack today because Satan knows that if he can destroy your marriage, if he can disrupt your marriage, he also gets to your children. That, that, that's part of his strategy, is he doesn't want you to have a healthy marriage where you talk uh, clearly with one another, where you pray together, where you fight to get on the same page, where you're fighting together for the future of your children. And so, so those of you in the room who are married, I'm, I'm encouraging you today, listen, don't, I, I'm not, I don't want you to fight with each other. I want you to fight for each other. I want you to fight for the health of of your marriage. It's kind of like being on an airplane. I know no one listens to the safety speech that they give um, at the beginning of a flight, but if you did, what they would tell you is that in, in case of, uh, of an emergency, that the oxygen is going to fall from the ceiling, right? And if you have a minor sitting beside you, what do they tell you? Put your mask on first before 
you help the minor. Do, do y'all remember that? I know no one listens to that, but that's what they tell you. And it's the same way when it comes to our marriage is that, that there's too many couples who their marriage is gasping for air, but they're paying attention to their children. I'm just telling you that your children can only be as healthy as your marriage. <laughs> Your, your, your relationship with them can only be as healthy as the relationship that you have with your spouse. And so I'm, I, I want to encourage you today to fight for the health of your marriage, to, to change your, your posture, to, to get ready because there's an enemy and he's after you. He's after your family. And the enemy is planning. He is making plans to destroy your family. In other words, the enemy is not just spontaneously mean. <laughs> he's, he, he's got a plan. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 8 says they all plotted, right? Nehemiah's enemies, they were plotting for his demise, right? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 8 talks about the schemes of the devil. And I'm trying to open your eyes today that when it comes to your family, there are plots and plans and schemes that are, are perfectly designed to destroy not just any family, but your family, <laughs> Like the enemy is very, he, he's after your family. He's, he's planning and he's scheming. He's, he's coming after your family. Now, I also want you to know, I believe the, that the enemy is also, while he's after your family, he's after the destruction of the, of the nuclear family that in, in America. And I don't want to get on a soapbox. And so you'll notice that I'm actually very carefully not going to name a, a specific political issue that might be uh, happening right now, but I do want to open your eyes to this, that there are serious strategies in our culture today uh, that are being promoted through our politics that are demonic and that their agenda is to destroy families. I'm just telling you, and you, you, you can figure out what I'm talking about, okay, or we can talk later. Our local government has been busy this year passing laws that I believe are a direct, this will sound strong, but a direct strategy from Satan to destroy families in New Mexico. One of the things that we're seeing here and across our nation is a move to take away parents' rights and to give them to the government. And I'm just, as a Christ follower, I believe this is wrong. And I'll just say this to you. Governor Grisham did not give birth to your son or your daughter. And she doesn't have the right to tell you what to do with your son or with your daughter. As Christian parents, it is your job and your job alone to become aware of the strategies, not the political strategies, but the strategies of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy, the plots of the enemy to undermine you as a parent. And here's what I'd say to you today is that parenting cannot be outsourced. There are, there are parts of your home you can outsource. If you want to hire a cleaner to clean your house, outsource it. No big deal, okay? But you cannot, mom and dad, outsource your ability to parent your child. You are the parent. It's your job to parent them. It's your job to teach them. It's your job to, to fight for them. It's your job to, to teach them God's word. This cannot be outsourced. And, and I'm just telling you, I'm seeing it all over that there's a lot of parents who are outsourcing the raising of their child to someone else, to the church, to the school, to, 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 to the television. To the, the, I'm telling you, parenting is being outsourced today. And I'm trying to wake you up in this message to understand that you are the parent, and we need you to be the parent. God's Word takes us really seriously. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, tells us uh, a lot in this verse about owning your responsibility for your family. Listen to what it says. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I'm just telling you, your first responsibility is to your home, to your marriage, to your children, to the ones that are in your home. That's your first responsibility. And when you understand that there's a strategy against your family, you change your posture. Here's a posture change that I think needs to happen in uh, the Christian family in America today. And it's just simply this, is that we need to get involved. 
We need to get involved. Here, here's a couple of ways. You need to get involved in your kids' lives. Let, let me make it really practical. You need to know your kids' friends. You need to know your, friend, your, your kids' friends' family. You need to know what your kids are doing online. You need to know what they're watching. You need to know what they're reading. You need to know what they're doing. You need to know where they're going. You need to know who they're calling. You need to know what they're doing on their phone. And some of you right now are like, gosh, this sure seems like a lot of work. Yeah, it's called being a responsible parent. Parenting doesn't, doesn't end when the baby is born. It starts and it is a lot of work. And again, I'll just go back to this idea. There's a lot of parents who birth a child, and then from there, they outsource the raising of that child. I, I will tell you a personal story that, that this, this past year, I, um, I just have felt so strongly on this. And I, I honestly feel like I was fairly involved as a father in our girls' lives, but I, I just felt like I needed to, to, to do more. I just, something w- woke up in me to pay a little more attention. And, and I'm just telling you, I didn't, I didn't have time for this, but I, I, I volunteered to, to help coach on the, the girls' track team. Both Ava and Eden are running track, so I volunteered to coach on their track team. And, and then now we've shifted into summer basketball. And so I met with the coach there, and I offered my assistance. And, and again, I, I don't know what it looks like in your family, but I, I always always want you to know this, that I try really hard to never preach anything that hasn't first made an impact on my own life. This is something that has been stirred within me recently, and I have re-engaged as a father in my own, in my own family, in my own children's lives, and, and I, I don't know what that might look for, like for you, but here's a posture change. We need to get involved in our kids' lives. Here's another area. I think we need to get involved in the local school. Don't outsource, I thought teachers might say amen, don't outsource your parenting to the local school, to to the teacher. You need to know who your kid's teacher is. You need to know the principal. You need to join the, you know, whatever the parent organization is in in your local school. Um, Some of of you might need to run for the school board because, oh my goodness, we need some godly voices on school boards. I'm just, I'm encouraging you to to get involved because if if you're wondering why there's so many crazy, unbiblical things that are happening in our local schools, I believe it's because not enough godly men and godly women have stepped up and gotten involved. We just kind of washed our hands of it. It's like, well, they're going to do what they're going to do. No, you have a voice. You need to be involved in in their local school. And and then I I would just say this is I think that the church needs to be involved in local government. The world loves for uh, the church to believe that we should not be involved in politics. They, they love to throw around this phrase, separation of church and state, <laughs> which, which, by the way, I, most people who use that phrase, I don't think it means what they think that it means. And I think it's time for the church to get involved, is that, that the problem actually is that the church has allowed a separation to happen between church and, polit- and politics. I think if you put the church back in politics, I think some amazing things could happen. So the posture change is not that of resignation that this is just how it is, but it's a posture of I'm going to get in the fight. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get involved in my kids' life and their their schools. I'm going to get involved in the local politics. Because here's what you need to know is that evil never stops itself. Have you noticed that? Evil, evil never just goes, ah, that's enough evil. We should just stop right there, right? It never stops itself. Can I tell you what stops evil? Godly people. Godly men, godly women can have the ability, because of Christ in you, you have the ability to stop the evil in your neighborhood, in your home, in your city, in your, I'm just telling you, that's how evil stops. So how do we stop evil? Well, you get really mad and really loud, and you just, you just be a jerk, right? No, no, no. So church, I just want to remind you, you know this, but I want to remind you that we don't fight the same way that the world fights, that we don't fight the same way that the devil fights. I, I just want to remind you that our weapons are different. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of 
this world. And I'll just say this about it. I don't have a lot of time to unpack this. But your number one weapon when it comes to fighting for your family is prayer. Your number one weapon, I'm just telling you, your number one weapon for your marriage is prayer. Your number one weapon for your kids is prayer. Your number one weapon is prayer. I was with a friend of mine, Chris, on the trip this week, and, and he, we were driving the, uh, a bus through Nicaragua, and he turned around, and he said, he said, man, I just got off the phone with my son. Can I just share a testimony with you? And he has an adult son, and I said, oh, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to hear it. He said, my son was in the process of changing jobs. And he said, and my son knows the Lord, but his, his, he's not passionate towards the Lord. And so when I found out that he was going to be changing jobs, I began to pray. And he said, I prayed this every day for three months. I said, Lord, as he changes jobs, but my ask is give him a supervisor that loves you. Give him a supervisor that, that, that will support him in his faith, that will encourage him, that will spur him on. And he said, you won't believe. He said, I just got a call from my son. He, he got a new job uh, just recently, and he called me to say, Dad, you'll never believe it. My supervisor is a believer. And, and Chris goes, and I said, I, I can't even believe that. And he said, no, I went, <laughs> right? And he said, Jason, there's nothing better. There's nothing better than seeing God answer prayers for your kids. Because can I tell you something? As much as you love your kids, God loves them more. I'm just telling you, I know you love your kids. But God loves them every bit as much and then a little bit more. And so when you're praying to him, when you're asking him to help you with your kids, it's like, it's easy. That's easy, right? There, there are a few things that my kids know that they can ask me, and I'll almost always say yes, right? Because they're already in my heart, right? So if they come to me, and this often happens, they say, hey, Dad, we're out of ice cream. Can we get more ice cream? Oh, yeah, that's easy, right? Now, if they come to me to ask for salad, I rebuke that. I kick, <laughs> right? It's like, Dad, can we, just, can we get a little more barbecue? Yes, 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 we can. That's what it's like when you're praying to God for your kids, when you're asking God to, to bless your kids and to keep them safe and to, 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 to give them a, a strong faith and to surround them with godly influences. God's up there like, oh, yeah, oh, yes, yes, I want that too. Let's, let's do this, right? You're coming in agreement with the heart of God. So your number one weapon when it comes to your family is prayer. Also, our posture is different. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35 says this, a new command I give to you. Love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And I felt like I had to tell you about this because I'm talking to you about fighting for your family. And that terminology, is kind of, it's kind of aggressive, right? It's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for my family. But you know this, it's all done in love. It's all done in love. The, the believer, the follower of Christ, the mark of our lives should be that of love. Let me, let me end by giving you a few strategies of Satan. I don't have time to unpack them. Maybe you can write them down and study these on your own. But here's six ways that the enemy comes against you and your life and your family. Number one, be really aware of this, is that the enemy will twist the word of God. He will twist the word of God. I was helping with a situation this week, um, and uh, my, my friend and I were just commenting, like, how did this person get so far off track? That was the comment. And, and as we, we talked about it, we realized this strategy of Satan is that he twists the word. The word. He, just, he, he, just, he, he wants it just to be just a little bit off. If he can get you just like 1% off of true north, and you start living that way long enough, you wake up one day and you're way off course. And that's what the enemy does. That's what he did in Genesis, right? Do you remember? He comes to Adam and Eve, and he, remember he kept saying this, did God really say? Right, that's part of it. He's, he's trying to twist it. He's just, just, just a little bit. He just, just a little bit. So that's a strategy of the enemies. He twists the word of God. Number two, he disguises himself. Again, you, know, you need to know that your enemy is tricky. He's sneaky. So he'll disguise himself to come at your family. Number three, he counterfeits. He counterfeits. It's, it's, it's not true, but it's, it's close enough. It's, a, it's like a, a counterfeit dollar, right? That, that the, most of us, I mean, we're not trained to be able to see the difference because it's really, really close. He counterfeits. Number four, he all out attacks. Number five, he accuses. Number six, he blinds. So I want to warn you, this will be my final warning, that if, uh, if you're on board with this idea 
that we're talking about today, if you're ready to embrace that your family, uh, you're going to fight for your family, then you need to know that if you do this, that your family will be different than most of the families in your neighborhood. That your family will be different than most of the families in, in your school or on your kids' sports team. That, that, that the family is going gonna, gonna to look different if you make this decision to pursue the path of the Lord for your family. It's going to look different. You're going to do things different. Your kids are, are going to listen to different music. They're going to watch different movies. They're, they're, you're going to handle social media differently than that of the unbelieving family. It's, it's going to be different. And what I, what, the reason I'm telling you this is there's going to be some pressure. There's going to be some pressure because there are some cultural norms that are at play in the world today. And you're going to feel a pressure to conform to those cultural norms. And not only are you going to feel it, but your kids are really going to feel it. Because every day you're sending them to school with people who think differently than you and your family. And so the ideas that you're teaching at home, they're going to face completely different ideas at school. And your kids are going to come home and they're going to have questions. And you're going to need to be willing to have the conversations with your kids about why you live a certain way. Why you make certain decisions. Why it's a, listen, I, I've used this line on my kids. I'll say, I am not your friend's parent. I am your parent. Right? Sometimes they'll say, in fact, next week's Father's Day, Ava's going to help me. And we were talking about this yesterday. And this idea, she, I'm so excited. She's going to help me preach. Next, this gonna be, you should not miss Father's Day. It's going to be so much fun. And I reminded her, because there's an experience. She's going to tell you about it next week. And she said to me, Dad, all the other kids are doing this. Any of y'all kids ever said that to you? She even said, all the kids at church are doing this. It was like a level up. Right? She wanted me to know it wasn't just the sinner kids, it was your kids. Right? <laughs> she used that line. She's like, Dad, all the church, all the, she named, she named your, this kid and this family and this kid. And I said, I, I am not their dad. I am your dad. And this is my decision. I'm sticking to it. We're going to talk about that next week. It's going to be really good. Your family will look different. If you decide to follow the way of the Lord. I'll tell you a story. When I was in school, this will date me, but it's okay. It, 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 you'll enjoy it. When I was in school, I was in high school, and they were going to do a, in, in, in PE class, they were going to do a, a couple of weeks where they were going to teach us how to dance. Do you all remember that? Were they, did they have that in your school? They taught you how to dance? And the boys had to dance with girls, right? And I came home, and I told my parents about this, and just, just go with me. I grew up in a, in a time when Christians did not dance, okay? And I came home, and my dad was like, you're not going to you're going to dance over my dad's body. And I'm like, okay, dad. He's like, calm down. And before I knew it, and listen, you just need to understand this. My mom was super involved in, like, in like school. She knew all our teachers. She knew everything. My dad, like, he kind of, he did other, he helped, like, he coached our baseball team. He did other things. He knew what was happening in school, but he rarely, should, he rarely got involved. And the next thing I knew, my dad had an appointment with my teacher. And I'm like, what? What are you doing? Stay out of my life. And my dad met, he met with the teacher, and he said this to, he said this to the teacher. He said, my son will not participate in this part of the curriculum. And not only that, but you will not punish him for it. And if you punish him for it, I will have your job by the end of this week. I'm like, Dad, why did you have to get all like gangster on him, you know? It was terrifying. And guess what? To this day, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> all goes back, right? I don't know. I don't know how this is my wife. I don't know how to dance. All goes back to high school PE, dance two-week class. I could have learned right there. My dad was like, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord, and at that time, that was part of that was we don't dance, right? You can laugh at it. It's okay. And I remember I was reflecting on that this week as I was writing this message because, if I'm honest with you, I was slightly embarrassed. I was, I was slightly embarrassed at that point. Like, Dad, why'd you have to do that? I was one of two kids that didn't participate in that. So it, it set me apart, right? And I had to deal with, like, why, why am I, why am I, but why am I different, right? But can I tell you something? Reflecting on that, I learned a lot 
about that encounter. I learned that my dad was ready to go toe-to-toe with anybody to raise me in the ways that he deemed best based on God's word. He wasn't going to give in to cultural norms. He wasn't going to listen. Nobody else got a vote on how I was raised except my mom and my dad. And I'll just be honest with you. I'm telling you this story today because I think culturally we've lost a little bit about a little bit of that. I'm here to tell you today, fight for your family. Why don't you stand with me? I want to end with, I want to go back to a verse in Nehemiah chapter 4, the rallying cry where he said this. He said, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your family, your sons, your daughters, your wives. Um, I'll just make that singular, your wife. (laughs) Your wife and your homes in your home. Nehemiah, um, I love the book of Nehemiah. It's a fantastic story of the people of God going to work and they face all kinds of setbacks and their enemy and the taunting and all the, the schemes. But what Nehemiah figured out, what we're reading here, is that he figured out that all the hard work wasn't enough, but that he needed the Lord to help him to rebuild his home. And today, I'm going to give you a chance in a few minutes, we're going to sing a, one last worship song. I'm going to come back up and I'm going to lead you in a closing prayer. And today, more than anything else, I want to invite you to invite God into your home. As you make decisions today to fight for your marriage, for your children, for your family, as you make decisions today, I want to encourage you that the first thing we're going to do is we're going to invite God into our lives to help us to design our families in the way that He is dreaming for us. So worship team, why don't you come, lead us in a final song, and then we're going to pray. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take a few minutes, and we're going go to we're gonna go to war. We're going to fight for our families. Let's worship for just a minute.